Mario Kart is one of the most well-known video games of all time, and that's pretty cool. Its broad appeal, low barrier of entry, and general design have enabled it to endure, getting gamers and non-gamers alike to play together, and actively placing it shoulder to shoulder with the series it was spun off from. To me, any game that can bridge that gap is special. But Mario Kart manages to do the unthinkable and still maintain a high skill ceiling that comes from track knowledge, mechanical depth, and item strategy. And as I say these things, I know some of you might be thinking to yourself, what are you talking about? This might not reflect your Mario Kart experience at all. For some, Mario Kart is a dice roll. No matter how good you get, the great equalizer known as the blue shell will claim you eventually, among other items that make victory feel luck-based. For others that pour hours into getting better at the game, smart item play can ward off the worst attacks and help you strategize for comebacks and defense. Of course, luck is always a factor. The famous Get Mario Carded video exists for a reason. We've all been there. But I wanted to take a deep dive into a series that has had a massive cultural impact and has become a mainstay as THE multiplayer game. I had a wide range of questions going into this video, like, how has this series endured for so long? How has nothing been able to dethrone it? If it truly leans on luck as much as some people say it does, wouldn't this game be frustrating to play at a high level? Are the mechanics of Mario Kart really that competitively viable? And how does the game bridge the gap in skill reasonably? Of course, the skill gap cannot be too great, but why do I feel like I still stand a chance against players better than me? These were all things that I never fully understood, and I was unaware of them as I would play matches. Then one day, I had an urge to look further, and I received some really satisfying answers to these questions. In fact, I would go as far to say that it made me appreciate Mario Kart on a far deeper level than I ever could have anticipated. This is not going to be your typical Mario Kart retrospective, so grab a snack and relax. We're going to take a trip through Mario Kart's history and examine just what it is that keeps us coming back for more. I'm Liam Triforce, and this is why I love Mario Kart. The game that started it all was released in 1992, establishing all of the mechanics that kart racers would shamelessly imitate and adapt for three decades. For the longest time, this was unlike anything else anyone had ever played. And to its credit, it did have at least one thing over F-Zero on the Super Nintendo. It had multiplayer. Super Mario Kart was actually born from that desire to have multiplayer in a racing game on the Super Nintendo. Though this meant that the tracks had to be simplified in comparison to F-Zero. This also led to Super Mario Kart feeling distinct as a racing game, and ultimately, more accessible. Utilizing the same technology as F-Zero, Mode 7, the game was co-directed by Hideki Kono and Tadashi Sugiyama. Kono went on to direct Mario Kart 64 as well, and he has had a close relationship with the series ever since. Sugiyama served as director for Pilot Wings, another game that used Mode 7 extensively. F-Zero and Super Mario Kart also share a programmer, Masato Kimura, this overlapping experience with both the design of a racing game and the technology of the Super Nintendo are what I believe made Super Mario Kart possible. In hindsight, Mode 7 did hinder the course design in Super Mario Kart. It already doesn't help that certain level themes are reused throughout each cup, but the flat, faux 3D course designs mean that each level feels very similar in terms of layout, because there is no actual 3D geometry with slopes, hills, or anything like that. This is not the fault of Super Mario Kart though, as it is just what was available with the technology at the time. And to its credit, the courses utilize its level elements to the fullest to deliver a satisfying game to play. The core mechanics of Super Mario Kart, and the series as a whole, revolve around three things. Items, track knowledge, and drifting. Items exist to level the playing field between players of varying skill levels, and have since become one of the most important mechanics in discussion of Mario Kart's balancing and accessibility. Most of you know these items by heart, but I'll go over them briefly. A mushroom gives you a brief speed boost that enables you to cut through off-road sections and whatnot. The green shells can be thrown with good aim to hit other racers. The red shell automatically locks onto the racer in front of you and cannot be blocked unless they have a defensive item of their own trailing behind them. Like the banana, which can be thrown in front of you or behind you as a hazard for everyone on the track. A boo lets you turn invisible for a little while and steal another player's item though this item doesn't appear in the single-player Grand Prix mode. 
A star turns you invincible and gives you a boost of speed, allowing you to take shortcuts and plow through everyone for a short period of time. And the rarest item in the game, the lightning, or the shock, only appears if you are in 5th to 8th place, and the chances of it appearing are slim at that. If you do happen to get it, the effects are devastating. Everyone is shrunken down and much slower for a brief period, and you can even run them over in this state and squish them. Now people can actually strategize around the shock just as much as you can wait for the right moment to strike. They can use a star if they're anticipating it, so you can wait until people are most vulnerable or at a difficult portion of a track. All of these items have seemingly simple applications, but these applications are so well-rounded with each fitting a specific need. They have since become staples across every game, and each imitator of Mario Kart's gameplay have their own versions of almost every item listed. That's how good and important these items are. Super Mario Kart also has items that would seldom appear in Mario Kart games after this one. Coins, for example, were a mechanic that only appeared in this game and Super Circuit, the Mode 7 entries if you will, and then later made their re-debut in Mario Kart 7 and 8. Coins increase your top speed. The more you have, the faster you go, though you'll also lose coins upon getting hit. 10 coins will get you to your maximum speed, but exclusively in this game and Super Circuit, you can have extra coins in the event that you get hit. At the risk of losing out on your top speed, coins actually force every player of different skill levels to take similar racing lines to keep their speed up, which is a great way of leveling the playing field, especially in the first lap where the most powerful items are less likely to appear. Of course, if another player is really good at collecting coins, then items aren't going to be as impactful, which is why coins were removed from the series until they eventually capped your maximum coin count at 10 in Mario Kart 7 and 8. A great move for the sake of balance. Another item that didn't return for a long time was the Feather, and when it did, it was exclusively in the battle mode for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. The Feather allows you to jump over hazards, off-road sections, and even walls to take massive shortcuts. The item doesn't appear in Mario Circuit or Donut Plains, but it is especially prominent in Ghost Valley, where you can shave off a lot of time if you know the tracks well enough. As is the case with any racing game, practice makes perfect. Only by playing these courses over and over again will you eventually be able to master each difficulty level and unlock the special cup. Each course has tight turns, gaps to cross, and off-road to keep your cornering in check, which is why the drift is such an important mechanic. Super Mario Kart's drift does not function at all like you would expect from later games in the series, and it has a bit of a learning curve. By pressing the shoulder button, you'll hop, then go into a power slide. This is par for the course with the rest of the series, but the power slide is primarily meant for driving around sharp corners, and you need to use it sparingly, otherwise you'll slide into the off-road constantly. What you need to do in order to correct your drift is do another hop, and then quickly tap in the opposite direction of your turn to straighten yourself out. If you do this correctly, you will cancel all of your sideways momentum from the drift and drive forward without losing any speed. This technique, though obtuse and not really conveyed at all in the manual, is key to mastering Super Mario Kart, and the game can have incredibly precise and fun controls should you put the time into learning how to play well. Other factors that contribute to getting better are knowing when to let go of the accelerate button around turns, and using your items strategically, rather than spamming them as soon as you get them in the hopes that you catch up. Essentially, the core of this game's skill floor and ceiling both come from the driving, while the gap is bridged through its items. With all that being said, this is not my go-to when it comes to racing games at all. If you ask me, F-Zero is the better Super Nintendo racing game. Though precise and fun, the control scheme of Super Mario Kart is more demanding for me than future installments, despite having its own merits. I mean, world record time trials of this game are beautiful demonstrations of its controls. I'm not gonna harp on them just because I suck at the game. It's just so different now compared to what we're all used to. I also just think some of the levels in this game are flat out annoying, offering challenges via obnoxious terrain and stage hazards, rather than genuine tests of reflexes and skill like Bowser's Castle and a certain multicolor road. The levels all feel pretty similar as a result of the hardware constraints, so I can barely tell the layouts apart anyway. It's also worth mentioning that the game is a wildly different experience solo than when you're playing against a friend. By working to unlock the Special Cup, you're not only forcing yourself to improve at the game, but also learning to avoid the computer-controlled racers because they straight-up cheat. Every character can use an unlimited number of their own specific items, 
some of which can't even be obtained in item boxes, like the poison mushroom and the egg. I suppose it isn't as bad as Mario Kart 64's cheating computer players, but we'll talk about that soon enough. It is worth it to win if only to see Bowser and Peach chugging champagne. These animations were removed in the international versions due to Nintendo of America's policies on depictions of drinking alcohol in games at the time, which is a shame because I love watching Bowser pour an entire bottle of champagne down his gullet. Peach looks like she's already drunk when she's sipping from the bottle. Nintendo should have kept this in future Mario Kart games, their policies be damned. I could definitely drink after winning the 150cc Special Cup. Speaking of which, there's one last course to talk about. The first appearance of the most iconic track in Mario Kart history, Rainbow Road. Like I mentioned, Super Mario Kart's limitations meant that only a few level themes could be used throughout each course, with only the track layouts changing between them. However, Rainbow Road is its own level theme, allocated to a single track at the end of the Special Cup, with the feeling of finally unlocking and reaching that track being one of this game's greatest moments. Rainbow Road features no guardrails to catch you should you overshoot a turn or make a mistake. You have to play perfectly if you want to win here. Not even items can save you if you fall too many times. But the feeling of being here amongst the colors and the stars, the pressure to succeed, and the music backing this monumental achievement, a culmination of your skill at the game, is what made Rainbow Road so iconic to begin with. And few games in the series really carried the weight this one did in a single player context. None of the games were as punishing in their mechanics as this one in Super Circuit. The Grand Prix only allows a finite amount of retries, treating them as extra lives, and you are straight up eliminated from the Grand Prix if you don't place at least fourth in a race. Earning Rainbow Road through skill made experiencing its visual splendor all the more worthwhile. Because there was nothing else like it, and because it was so much fun to master, Super Mario Kart became the standard for any and all kart racers going forward. Any subsequent game in the genre would be judged based on its ability to live up to everything Mario Kart established, and what sets it apart for the better. And while Super Mario Kart did inspire a few imitators on the Super Nintendo, it wouldn't be until Mario Kart 64 where the genre would truly blossom into something of its own. Mario Kart 64 was first revealed in 1995 as Super Mario Kart R, the R standing for Rendered. At this point, pre-rendered 3D graphics had appeared in Rare's Donkey Kong Country and Killer Instinct games, and Nintendo opted to use this technique as displaying 8 3D models simultaneously in one race would have made the Nintendo 64 catch fire. Rare even provided the model for Donkey Kong in the final game. Ultimately, it led to Mario Kart 64 having a distinct look, one that made the game resemble the beautiful 3D renders of this era of Mario. This soft, plasticine look permeated the Nintendo 64 era, and Mario Kart 64 was pretty much the only game on that console that was able to accurately translate the look and feel of those renders into a game, thanks to the pre-rendered sprites. On a modern display, these visuals may look pixelated with jagged edges, but that was not how they were meant to look. As is the case with most sprite-based games from the time, they were usually played on a CRT, and the difference is staggering. CRTs leave space in between each pixel to create what we'd call a scanline effect these days, and it usually hides the jagged edges that we're used to seeing now on LCD screens in emulation. This is why this game and Donkey Kong Country looked so much better on CRTs and strengthened the illusion of these 3D graphics being displayed in real time. It might sound like I'm going on a long tangent about this, but the pre-rendered visual style of Mario Kart 64 utterly fascinated me when I was young, and I am still passionate about how good this style looked back in the day, even if I wasn't around to experience its origins. Mario Kart 64 makes several strides in improving on the original game, as you could imagine. It's a fully 3D kart racer, meaning that level geometry can now have the complexity and variety that the original game sorely lacked. Slopes, ramps, hills, and curves, and each track has a distinct aesthetical design that extends to the layout and the hazards you face. To compensate for these new possibilities, Mario Kart 64 has a bouncier and much looser control scheme in comparison to the original game, which the developers compare to an RC car, a shift in physics and momentum that would eventually evolve into what is now standard for Mario Kart. Drifting in this game no longer feels like you're rotating the entire game world just to make a turn. Instead, 
you drift outward and can tilt the control stick left and right to either tighten or widen the trajectory of your drift. If you tilt the stick left and right rapidly during a drift, you can charge a mini turbo. Once your smoke trail turns red, you can release the drift for a burst of speed, signaled by a voice line from the character you're playing as. Though it was technically in Super Mario Kart, Mario Kart 64's implementation of the mechanic quickly made it one of the most important in a kart racer. Drifting wasn't just about taking tight corners anymore, it was about optimizing them for bursts of speed and snaking back and forth on straightaways to go even faster. The importance of the precision of Super Mario Kart's turns were traded for a wide and especially more beginner-friendly mechanic, but one that has a considerable amount of depth when it comes to being the fastest. And I'm fine with that. As you can no doubt tell by the impact it left on Mario Kart and kart racers in general, this was the right decision. Though Mario Kart 64 is very much the same game in structure, every single course has more identity, and the game offers way more variety as a whole. Every level's bumps and jumps give the karts a physical element that the flat courses lacked, and it contributes heavily to what makes this game so much fun to play. You can use these jumps to skip portions of the level, which probably contributed to the removal of the feather item. The game eases you in with Luigi Raceway, but then comes a hectic loop with Moo Moo Farm, the tight turns and cheeky shortcuts in Koopa Beach, and the wide open terrain and annoying hazards of Calamari Desert and Sherbet Land. Frap Snowland is one of my favorite levels because you can use the off-road sections to your advantage on multiple occasions. It feels like a level that wants you to break the rules of the road. Wario Stadium tests you on your ability to drift effectively for mini turbos, as does Chaco Mountain. Toad's Turnpike forces you to race through moving traffic. Bowser's Castle and DK Jungle Parkway have multiple distinct sections that test you on different things, including those tight bridge sections that essentially become funnels for items. Speaking of which, let's talk about items. While the feather may have been removed, a few new items have been implemented. Notably, mushrooms, green shells, and red shells have all tripled variations, opening up possibilities for shortcuts and both offensive and defensive buffs as you attempt to reach first place. It's more chaotic for sure, but also simultaneously more strategic. You can also get a bunch of bananas, allowing you to trail five banana peels behind you and create an insane defense against shells. This was such an impenetrable wall that they changed it to a triple banana item in later games and had them rotate around you like the shells did. Then there's the fake item boxes you can place to trick or otherwise block certain shortcut paths, and the golden mushroom that lets you spam the effect of a mushroom over and over for a limited time, which is great for taking shortcuts and closing the gap between you and first place. However, the most important addition here is the introduction of the great equalizer itself, the blue shell. When this thing is thrown, the player in first has no choice but to submit to its power. In this specific game, there is nothing you can do to stop it. Everyone must submit to the great equalizer eventually. It usually appears at least once during a race, and it quickly became an essential item in turning the tides. This is where the conversation of skill versus luck truly began with Mario Kart. You could race as well as possible, save all of your items for defense while you're front running, and then a blue shell would come hit you, giving the other racers just enough time to catch up and assault you with every other item under the sun. It happens. The blue shell is a necessary evil, however. By disallowing the most skilled players to front run for the entirety of the race, that skill gap can be bridged, and Mario Kart can be a more enjoyable experience for everyone that wants to give it a shot. Even for those that get hit by a blue shell, so long as they learn to accept the Great Equalizer as a natural part of each race. Just open your arms and embrace it. It comes for us all eventually. All of this makes Mario Kart 64 one of the greatest multiplayer games of its era. The drift mechanic is more accessible and simultaneously more satisfying thanks to the Mini Turbo. The levels are great fun and reward you with a more tactile physical response to each bump in the road. With a 4-player split-screen mode, the game became a staple for game nights around the world. And I haven't even mentioned Battle Mode. While Super Mario Kart had its own Battle Mode, it felt like a prototype for what was to come. With Mario Kart 64, you had three other players to throw items at, and the arenas were more complex giving you more places to take cover and sneak up on people. As a single-player game, however, Mario Kart 64 cheats. I was half-joking when I said that Super Mario Kart's AI cheats in reference to their unlimited special items, but Mario Kart 64 is on another level. 
Right, so in order to unlock mirror mode and complete the game, so to speak, you have to clear all of the cups on 150cc. Mario Kart 64 intensely uses <clears throat> dynamic difficulty balancing, to put it gently. Depending on your performance in a single-player Grand Prix, racers will speed up and slow down accordingly, as if you are all connected on a giant rubber band. See what I'm getting at? This makes staying in the lead on levels like Toad's Turnpike infuriating, as it's very easy to accidentally swerve into traffic when trying to cut corners, and then suddenly everyone catches up to you. Front running in single player is a nightmare on the more difficult levels because of the constant pressure of the AI catching up to you if you make a mistake. And when talking about the special cup, Yoshi Valley is just awful. I see what they were going for with the alternate routes, in case you want to avoid items and other racers, but the paths are usually way too skinny, and there's always a fastest route to take anyway, so it's definitely my least favorite level. On the plus side, reaching Rainbow Road is a powerful reward and the music is outstanding. Kenta Nagata composed the score for Mario Kart 64, whom you might know better as the man who composed and arranged the theme for Dragon Roost Island in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Considering it was his first time ever composing for a Nintendo game, it's amazing just how much of an impact he left on Mario Kart's overall sound. From the title theme's decision to draw out the original Super Mario Kart melody, to the exquisite and ethereal sound of Rainbow Road's melody. A portion of this melody quickly became the leitmotif we associate with earning the sights and sounds of Rainbow Road. And what a feeling it is to hear. Rainbow Road in Mario Kart 64 is unique in that it is primarily an endurance run. It is by far the longest track in the game, even if you do the cheeky hop at the beginning of the race to skip a large portion of it. Rather than lacking guardrails and forcing players to master sharp turns, the level is all about the core driving experience and everything that entails. Especially after clearing levels that are much harder than this, I welcome something this focused. You can just take in the joy of racing along the great rainbow in the sky. This isn't a course I regularly race on due to its length, and it's certainly not my favorite Rainbow Road, but I still love revisiting it as both a reward and as an endurance run during multiplayer races. Despite its single-player quirks, Mario Kart 64 is a truly great game. It solidified kart racing as a bona fide video game genre, adapting the mechanics established in Super Mario Kart into something that I believe anyone can still pick up and play. It established multiple mechanics that would become a mainstay in Mario Kart, and paved the way for how the series plays in the modern day. Which is funny, because the next Mario Kart game deliberately took a step backwards for the sake of the Game Boy Advance. This is Mario Kart Super Circuit, which is less of a sequel to Mario Kart 64, and more of a sequel to Super Mario Kart because it plays exactly the same way. Flat tracks and everything. There is certainly more variety in track theming and layout though, and it adapts every item from Mario Kart 64, with the exception of the banana bunch and the fake item boxes. It also has interesting bits of its own, some of which foreshadow the future of the series. For example, this is the first Mario Kart game to explicitly show each character's stats on the select screen. Stats are incredibly important to both high-level Mario Kart, and what generally makes certain characters viable in the first place but the games don't always communicate these things effectively. Let's start at the beginning. The two previous games in the series divided each of the characters' stats by weight classes, light, medium, and heavy, with the lower and higher end of the scale having specific advantages and disadvantages. In Super Mario Kart, the manual provided a detailed breakdown of not just each character's stats and advantages, but also their performance on each track. None of this information is in the base game, which was kind of par for the course at the time, but it is almost certainly lost on most players today. Most people consider Bowser and Donkey Kong Jr. the best characters due to their top speed being the highest, but there's nothing wrong with picking other characters while learning how to play the game. Plus, they all have their own advantages on each course. In Mario Kart 64, the lightweights are the fastest instead, and they have the best acceleration, with their only real disadvantages being their loss of speed on turns, and their low weight making them susceptible to getting bumped around. Their positives far outshine the negatives though, making the lightweights the best by a long shot. 
The heavyweights have low acceleration and their off-road traction is pretty terrible, but they turn well, and the middleweights Mario and Luigi are fine enough choices all around. Overall, it's not much of an issue. You can play whoever suits your playstyle in this game. When we get to the GameCube and beyond, we'll be able to paint a more vivid picture of how stats affect each game's balance, and your ability to acclimate to the game as a whole. Now, there's another piece to this puzzle. Though Super Circuit is the first game to actually display character stats in-game, there are still a few hidden stats that neither the game or the manual tell you about. The manual still references the characters in their weight classes, but there are more stats to each character, and the only way people would have been able to unearth them back then is through a Japanese-only guidebook. These stats are speed, braking, handling, drift, and off-road. The kicker here is that the speed the game is referring to on the select screen is actually a character's acceleration, which is a massive, disgusting oversight. You might have thought that Bowser was nerfed to hell and back while looking at his stats in-game, but no, he's still the fastest character in the game. In fact, most of the characters in this game are comparable to their Super Nintendo counterparts, which makes sense, but the game certainly tricked me into believing otherwise for a while. While it's clear to see how hard they messed up in Super Circuit's case, this lack of communication persisted throughout several games, and we'll be looking at how and why soon enough. Other than that, I don't have much else to say about Super Circuit. I don't think the control is quite as tight as Super Mario Kart, but I do enjoy a lot of the courses it features, and in particular, I love this game's Rainbow Road. The edges of the course may not have guardrails, but they instead make you bounce up in the air, leading to some incredible shortcut potential if you know what you're doing. It's one of the best feelings this game gave me. On top of these courses being pretty fun, it also includes all of the Super Nintendo courses as an added bonus. Super Circuit did allow for 4-player multiplayer, but this was restricted to the link cable, and you need 4 consoles, 4 link cables, and 4 copies of the game to get the full experience. No, that's not happening. Not as long as Mario Kart is available on home consoles. I never knew anyone that had a link cable for any reason other than Pokemon anyway. Also, to date, Super Circuit is the last game to overtly feature those plasticky models of the Nintendo 64 era. Farewell, Plastic Mario. I'll miss you. With that, let's move on to the next home console Mario Kart game, Double Dash. For the longest time, I considered it my favorite Mario Kart game for its controls, drifting, item strategy potential, creativity, soundtrack, and multiplayer possibilities. It is still unlike any other Mario Kart game. That said, it is also a bit of a chaotic mess, which, to be fair, is also part of the reason why I love it, but... Yeah, let's take a look. The hook of Double Dash is the ability to choose a combination of any two characters and one of many carts, so long as the cart matches the weight class of the heaviest character in your combo. Each character has their own special items, so you can mix and match items to see which ones you like most in actual races. Mario and Luigi get fireballs that come out like a shotgun blast. It's nothing like the bullshit fireball in Mario Kart 8 that rewards bad players for what is essentially a spammable set of green shells. This one is actually fair while still packing a punch. Peach and Daisy have a heart that steals items when they hit other carts, which is a highly strategic and situational item, but I've put it to good use from time to time. Yoshi and Birdo get an egg that functions like a red shell and spills out three items on the track for you and other players to pick up. Baby Mario and Baby Luigi get a chain chomp that drives for them and smashes through anything and anyone in its path. The triple greens and triple reds have been reserved for the Koopa and Paratroopa this time, just as the golden mushroom is reserved for Toad and Toadette. Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong get a giant banana that spreads out into normal bananas when hit, Wario and Waluigi get a bob bomb that explodes shortly after being thrown, and Bowser and Bowser Jr. get a giant ricocheting shell that covers a lot of ground and stops at nothing to wreak havoc. As the instruction manual says, it's the very image of Bowser himself. PD Piranha and King Boo are unique in that once unlocked, they can obtain any of the special items in item boxes. So if you don't want a guaranteed special item and would rather roulette through all of them and adapt your playstyle to whatever item you get, you can try that out. For me, it's more fun to mix and match and experiment with a combo I like most. This would actually become the foundation for Mario Kart games moving forward, especially Mario Kart 7 and 8, just without these special items thrown into the mix. To complement having two racers on your cart, you can also grab a double item box, 
which gives each of your characters an item. You can swap drivers at any time, allowing you to strategize and choose which item you want to use and which you want to save, which adds another significant layer to item play in races. You also can't trail items behind you like you could in previous games. In order to counter an item, you need to time your throw based on experience. To compensate, you no longer get severely punished for being hit by something like a red shell. Instead, you flip over, and then you can immediately get back to racing. The only exceptions to this are the babam and blue shell. It's enough of a punishment that it allows people to close the gap, but it also gives you enough time for a comeback. There's also no spin-out prevention tactics anymore. In previous games, you could prevent a spin-out by hitting the brakes at the right time, but that has been removed in order to keep the game moving. All of these changes keep the game moving, in fact, and they keep the action frenetic, yet controlled. Where things get truly fantastic is this game's take on drifting. Like Mario Kart 64, you build up a mini turbo by rocking the control stick left and right. But in Double Dash, it can build up much faster, and by snaking back and forth on the track, you can blitz through races at unprecedented speeds. The drift not only gives you an incredible amount of control around sharp turns, of which there are plenty in Double Dash, but it also enables you to go faster than ever before. In Double Dash, the carts also have this visceral, realistic feel to them, which makes drifting around courses feel exhilarating as you fight to maintain control at all times. Combine this feeling with advanced techniques like the R-Tech for tighter turns, and the A-Tech, which lets your cart essentially mini-turbo in a straight line if you let go of Accelerate between drifts, and you have what I believe is my favorite Mario Kart game in terms of core racing mechanics. Double Dash also has a lot of my favorite courses in the history of the series. Peach Beach, Sherbet Land, and Dry Dry Desert are perfect courses for practicing your drifting, not just on open-ended terrain, but also along tight turns. Mushroom Bridge and Mushroom City introduce traffic into a stage in a more digestible manner, especially Mushroom City with its two branching paths and off-road shortcuts. I have many favorite tracks in this game, which is a great indicator of their quality. Daisy Cruiser is one of them for its inspired concept and tight, challenging track design, and that goes ditto for Waluigi Stadium. DK Mountain is a perfect showcase for this game's physics, and what they add to the feeling of racing, and the concept is still incredible. You drive up to the cannon, and then you find yourself barreling down a mountain, at times even losing control of your cart due to the bumpy roads, before taking two extremely sharp turns and heading over a bridge, only to do it all over again. Then comes the Special Cup. Wario Coliseum only has two laps, but those laps contain some of the trickiest turns in the game. Dino Dino Jungle is also fittingly difficult, with narrow paths and lots of prehistoric hazards to avoid. Bowser's Castle follows in its predecessor's footsteps and provides us with the penultimate test of our driving, before Rainbow Road does the same. And I swear this is one of the toughest Rainbow Roads to perform well on in the 3D Mario Kart games. When there's guardrails, they're used on turns that demand you drive optimally. When there aren't, you have to either risk using boost pads or drive as carefully as possible. Drifting on this track will get you far, but man is it hard to do so. It's all worth it to hear that iconic music once more. It feels great to drive among the stars, and you can even see a city below you, selling this feeling that you've ascended as a result of your own driving skills. Double Dash's Rainbow Road feels like it was designed specifically for the game's unique controls and drifting, which is probably why it has yet to appear in any Mario Kart game since. The thing that really opens this game up to being my favorite in the series are its multiplayer capabilities. You have the standard four-player split-screen as always, but you also have the option to play co-op, with one player driving and the other on the back of the cart throwing items. This fleshes out the competitive nature of this game far more than you might think. While the player in the front drives as they always would and can pass the other player items if need be, the player on the back plays a role just as important as the person actually driving. They are the one that manages items, and they need to communicate with their driver at all times to strategize. They also need to know when to actually time their item throws, both offensive and defensively, because once again, you can't trail items in this game. Your driver depends on you. Most importantly though, they are the ones that have to manage rocking the control stick back and forth when their driver enters a drift. This significantly reduces the load on the driver, who can simply focus on driving well and not having to manage a mini-turbo. And it also means that mini-turbos can be more frequent. They can simply time their boosts while the other player moves the stick left and right. The player on the back of the cart can also perform an exclusive move to co-op, 
which shifts the cart left and right depending on which trigger you press. You can do this to hit other drivers, steal items, and even dodge red shells with good timing. This, in my opinion, is the best way to play Double Dash, hands down. It is a beautiful way to appreciate not just the finesse of Double Dash's drifting, but also its strategy, something that is often neglected in discussion of Mario Kart. Not every player in the room has to do co-op either, which is great, it actually gives you options. Co-op also extends to battle mode, which features not only the classic balloon battle mode, but also introduces bob Blast and Shine Thief, which are both absolute chaos, especially with Double Dash's item balance. bob Blast in particular throws the concept of balance out the window as you grab fat stacks of bombs and then spam them at your opponent. Thankfully, Double Dash's maps have plenty of cover and routes for you to take, unless you're playing Cookie Land, Tilt-A-Cart, or the Nintendo GameCube, which are basically just cage matches. Good luck! For all of these reasons, Mario Kart Double Dash was my favorite game in the series for a long time. But I hesitate to call it that definitively. To begin with, let's talk about hidden stats again. While I am happy to report that Double Dash is mostly accurate in reporting stats on the select screen, and it even includes the speed and acceleration stats separately, there are also significant stats that are not reported anywhere in-game. Introduced in this game, the Mini Turbo stat governs how long the boosts from your Mini Turbos last, and the only way to learn about it and other hidden stats is by looking at the game's data. Again, why are we doing this? Is it so we don't overwhelm players with options? I can get down with that, but I think transparency is most important, especially when you're running time trials and trying to unlock the parade cart through the Mirror All Cup Tour. Thankfully, the stats at least make some sense when you look at the raw numbers. The lightweights have the highest mini turbo, and the heavier the cart gets, the lower the mini turbo stat. Same goes for off-road speed. So at the very least, the stats have some rhyme or reason. Well, I say that, but sometimes the off-road speed for specific carts in each weight class is absurdly high or low for no reason. I don't get this game, man. Oh, and the top speed stat being lower per lighter weight class just simply doesn't apply to the barrel train. The manual notes that lightweights have generally low top speeds, but the barrel train is the second fastest cart in the game. Combine this stat with the other stat advantages that the lightweights have, and there you have it. The barrel train is the best cart in the game. It is just simply built different. Some people also just haven't been able to acclimate to Double Dash because of the controls. Though I personally love them, I can totally understand why they won't be everyone's cup of tea. Because of how the carts respond to terrain, the control can feel loose, especially when you get sent flying off of a piece of geometry. On top of that, the game's turning does generally feel more slippery than previous installments. Only when you master the drift can you truly negate that, which is probably why I was never bothered by this game's controls. It also probably doesn't help that this is my most played Mario Kart game, and I cannot view this game from the lens of someone that has never played it before but I at the very least acknowledge how different it feels to play, for better or worse. Now let's talk about items. Items in Double Dash are a tad overpowered because of its unique special item mechanic that I touched upon earlier. People will be throwing homing items at you frequently, you'll see crap flying everywhere in an average race, it really is a war zone out there on pretty much every track, especially the short ones like Luigi's Circuit. While the game compensates for this by merely flipping your cart in a direction and letting you continue driving, things get murky when you begin to play like a degenerate and sandbag during the race. Listen up, because I'm only going to say this once. Sandbagging, or bagging for short, is the act of deliberately underperforming in a race. In Mario Kart, bagging is usually used to acquire powerful items that can aid in making a comeback, and even protecting against items like the Shock or the Great Equalizer. You slow down, grab some items, and then once you're satisfied, you get moving. This is a strategy that works in every Mario Kart game, and good Mario Kart players are usually selective about when they use this strategy. It depends on the length of a course, the circumstances of the race, if they have a large enough lead, and if they are able to sufficiently defend themselves while front running. If a player decides to bag, and they know the right time to do it, it can more often than not decide the entire race. This is why people hate this strategy, but there's nothing stopping them from doing it too. And you can strategize for when people bag by grabbing a star yourself and holding onto it for as long as you can, racing well enough to get ahead of the pack, predicting a shock to the best of your ability, 
and zooming into first place. It just goes to show that Mario Kart is more a game of skill than people think. Now that you know what sandbagging is, imagine doing that in this game, where the items turn races into the Normandy landings, except it's a free-for-all and we're all trying to get off those boats. Item strategy is possible in Double Dash, especially in smaller matches, but in single player, four player split screen, and especially larger land matches where everyone is skilled at the game, yeah, it's not exactly what I'd call balanced. And don't even get me started on Baby Park. This is where you need to learn to hang onto your items for the sake of protection against all of the stuff flying in every direction. On this course, think of items like insurance rather than something to mindlessly throw ahead of you. Otherwise, Baby Park is an actual dice roll. If the goal of each Mario Kart race is to come in first place, then I want to feel as informed as possible in trying to achieve that goal. When I'm trying to pick a cart that adapts to my playstyle, I need to know the very things that the game is hiding from me. On top of that, it is crucial to know this information when doing time trials, and because the game is finicky about this info, then you're likely bottlenecking your best times without even realizing it. Because Double Dash's driving mechanics are so brilliant, I want to play this game at a higher level. And while time trials are basically unaffected by this game's balancing issues, the main game is still absolute chaos. But in a sense, I think this game embraces its own unbridled chaos. It is unconcerned with being anything more than pure fun for everyone, and its items, though overpowered, almost certainly bridge the gap in skill between players. The game symbolizes the chaos in its soundtrack quite often. It knows exactly what it wants to be, and that's where a lot of its charm comes from. It just wants everyone to have a good time, and the game does an incredible job of ensuring that every time I play it with my friends. I still love Double Dash with all my heart, in spite of its quirks. That said, Mario Kart's competitive scene grew more and more after this entry, and the series would only further attempt to address its own viability as a competitive, but fair game. The next game was Mario Kart DS, and it was awesome. Though it was a portable game, it was a fully-fledged Mario Kart game in every respect, fleshing out the series' gameplay formula in multiple ways. It streamlined the local multiplayer experience for portability with DS download play, it was the first to feature online multiplayer, it let you pick from one of several unlockable carts, and its single-player offerings were pretty robust too. To this day, I don't think a Mario Kart game's single-player content has come close. You have the traditional four cups, an additional four cups exclusively made up of retro courses, and a mission mode where you have to achieve certain criteria, with boss fights once you get a certain rank on every mission in a world. The boss fights all play into concepts from previous Super Mario games, except you're in a cart. And while that may sound lame, it's actually a lot of fun. To be honest, I've already talked about this game in my DS retrospective, so I won't go into too much detail about the surface level content. As a blanket statement, Mario Kart DS is an excellent game in terms of content and course design. Especially course design, there are a lot of great levels in this game. But now, let's get into the real meat of the gameplay. First, items. The special item mechanic from Double Dash has been removed, with some being implemented into the game as normal items. The Golden Mushroom is back to being an item you can get when you're lagging behind, as is the Babam, the Boo, and the Triple Greens and Triple Reds, which rotate around you as they do in the other games. You can also trail items again, and though I enjoyed the skill-driven nature of timing your defensive items when a red shell was on your trail, I think trailing has utility beyond just defending from an item because you can also drive into other players that might be tailgating you to punish them. If you're following too closely behind someone that's trailing an item, you are forced to get out of the way. It's a great mechanic that has since become a mainstay in the series. Our two new items this time have also stuck around since, the blooper and the bullet bill. Though its utility is lost on computer players and it is useless in every game after this until Mario Kart 8, it is quite annoying to get inked on a Nintendo DS screen. The Bullet Bill, on the other hand, is easily one of the best items to ever be introduced in the Mario Kart series. Somewhat reminiscent of the Chain Chomp from Double Dash, when you use it, the bill will steer for you and blitz through all racers in its path. It's a great item for closing the gap between you and first place. And it can even dodge lightning because you are completely invincible while using it. As is the case with any item, you can save it for as long as you want, at least until someone uses the shock and takes it from you. As for the core gameplay, 
Mario Kart DS allows you to pair a character with a cart of your choice, with each character and cart having their own stats to consider. In fact, Mario Kart DS finally makes the decision to show nearly every single stat on the cart select screen, with the exception of the Mini Turbo stat, of course. There's also more stats if you look at the game's data, but in this case, I'm not gonna do that because there is way too much for any average player to even begin to digest. The in-game stats are comprehensive enough for you to make an informed decision when combining your favorite character with a cart, and I appreciate that. Though character-specific stats are not made clear, and honestly I disagree with the concept entirely because I just want to play as my favorite character and not have to worry about hidden stats, you can at least surmise the impact each character has immediately by looking at the stat differences on a single cart. The only stat in this game I vehemently disagree with is the item stat. Believe it or not, this stat actually governs your chances of getting better items, like triple mushrooms, triple reds and whatnot, and a low item stat means you won't get the typical three mushrooms in time trials. I can't begin to tell you how stupid it is to have an item stat in this game, and thankfully, it never returned. Ironically, I think listing all of the stats creates an inverse dilemma for the Mario Kart series. While it is nice that those taking the game a little more seriously have a clearer idea of what to expect, it alienates casual players that just want to use a cart that looks cool. Do I prefer this over the old method of handling stats though? Yes, yes I do. Really, it's hard to please everybody, and figuring out a balance between these things would be a journey for the series. Other than that, Mario Kart DS plays like a dream. It has incredibly precise and lenient controls, especially when it comes to drifting. Recovering from a mini turbo is so satisfying, and it allows you to immediately initiate another one if you have room on the track. This is the bread and butter of Mario Kart DS, snaking back and forth on straightaways by building a mini turbo as fast as possible. In online multiplayer, this was the biggest skill check. If you were not snaking back and forth to build constant mini turbos, you would lose regardless of what items you pulled. This created a significant enough skill divide where I would only want to play Mario Kart DS with my friends. I never felt like I could get good enough at Mario Kart DS without shredding the skin off of my thumb from rocking it back and forth on the D-pad. Ironically, the only course I felt I could perform sufficiently on was Rainbow Road, because you couldn't mindlessly snake along straightaways. In a competitive game, I believe the casual and competitive experience should be unified in two ways. The first is that both experiences should feel similar to one another, to the point where they are indistinguishable in any real regard other than pure skill and strategy. In Mario Kart DS, the divide between casual and competitive is snaking. This was an issue in Double Dash as well, to be fair, but I feel Mario Kart DS's more precise controls just amplify that issue. Instead, the transition from casual to competitive should feel relatively seamless through experience, rather than forcing players to play a certain way. With that in mind, the second way in which these two experiences should be unified is by allowing players to compete with their preferred playstyle. Snaking boxes them into playing a specific way if they want to win, which is not really ideal, especially in a game with so much character and cart variety. Of course, if you're playing with people of a similar skill level, this isn't of any concern. I had a blast with Mario Kart DS in pretty much every regard, except for online multiplayer. But this mentality of boxing players into a specific playstyle lingered. This is Mario Kart Wii. A game I have so many fond memories of playing, a game that feels amazing to play, is also the most busted game in the entire series. It is just as beautiful as it is alienating. By the end of this discussion, I'm sure you'll understand why some people view this game as the melee of the Mario Kart series. First of all, it's a great game. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. Its battle mode may only allow you to play against one another on teams, but Coin Runners is a great improvement on Shine Runners for Mario Kart DS, and I love trying to see how many coins I can stack at once. Like previous entries, Mario Kart Wii's courses are generally fantastic. I love Maple Treeway, DK Summit, Toad's Factory, Coconut Mall, I mean naturally, who doesn't? I love them not just for their phenomenal and varied design, set pieces, theming, and skill-driven depth, but also because of what Kart Wii's new features enable. First of all, the number of racers has been bumped up from 8 to 12, which adds even more chaos, but I welcome it. It definitely doesn't feel like too many racers at this number. 
it just allows more people to play at once. Also, starting with this game, you can trick off of bumps and ramps by either shaking the Wii Remote or pressing a direction on the D-pad on a traditional controller. This gives you a mini turbo when you land, and you can also angle your tricks to land quickly and get the boost sooner. This is not only a great feature for the new courses, but it also transforms older courses that had physical bumps in a really satisfying way, like Waluigi Stadium or DK Mountain. In addition, this game has completely revamped drifting in response to the snaking technique, creating too large of a skill gap in previous games, especially in Mario Kart DS. Now, your mini turbo will build regardless of whether or not you flick the analog stick back and forth, and you can charge it faster by taking a tighter turn, or slower by tilting away from the drift. This not only gives you more control when trying to take a drift and build the mini turbo, but it also makes the game far more accessible, and it has since become standard for all future Mario Kart games. Mario Kart Wii also introduces motorcycles to the formula for the first time, and this is where my feelings on this game get complicated. These things let you pop a wheelie for extra speed whenever you want, effectively making them better than any kart could ever be, especially on straightaways. Certain bikes have something known as inside drifting. What this means is that when you drift, your bike will naturally turn inward. This makes for way more precise cornering, which can save huge chunks of time. Every other kart and bike has outside drifting, which is the standard form of drifting that other 3D Mario Kart games default to, and in this game's case, it is much slower. Basically, Mario Kart Wii should be called Mario Bike Wii, because although you can win with a kart, you are putting yourself at a major disadvantage if you don't use a bike, especially one with inside drifting. Ironically, the solution that Nintendo aimed to implement to close that massive gap in skill ended up boxing players into yet another style of play. Whenever I play this game with friends, I usually win because they don't like using inside drift or using wheelies or anything like that. They are simply not allowed to have their own playstyle unless they train in the mountains to beat these bikers. It also probably doesn't help that the game's balance favors speed, mini turbo, and inside drift above pretty much all else. In Mario Kart Wii, you can build a stationary mini turbo to completely negate the low acceleration of high speed vehicles, making the acceleration stat almost pointless. Thankfully, Mario Kart Wii had the sense to display a thorough breakdown of each vehicle's stats, and I can't thank them enough for finally doing this, but it's a shame that the most optimal way to play Mario Kart Wii ignores a lot of these stats. At casual and competitive levels, you're looking at completely different games. The issue that Mario Kart DS had is on full display here, and because of all this, the best combo in the game is Funky Kong Flame Runner. It's extremely fast, it has inside drift, and Funky Kong himself adds the highest speed bonus. Each weight class has its own version of this combo, like Daisy and the Mock Bike, for example, but this is why you'll always see online multiplayer lobbies filled with Funky Kongs. I use Rosalina in the Flame Runner because of the added mini turbo bonus, because I'm a contrarian, and also just because I really like Rosalina. <laughs> there is some room for experimentation in this game, but not much. Usually it's about picking your favorite character and a specific bike. And sometimes your character just isn't good enough. I think there's something to be said about just wanting to pick a combo based on how cool it looks. A lot of my friends echo this same sentiment. Mario Kart was born from a desire to create a more casual, party-friendly racing game, and as the game attempted to achieve more depth in both its mechanics, stats, and variety of combos, it felt as though the spirit of the series was gradually slipping away, especially if you decided to race online. The simplicity that Mario Kart 64 achieved was lost almost completely to tech that vastly widens the gap between the skill floor and the skill ceiling. And while this was true for Double Dash and especially DS, Mario Kart Wii felt like that widening gap was stretched to such extremes that it simply isn't fun to play this game any other way. Of course, if you're oblivious to all of this and you just decided to play with your friends in a combo that you liked, they're all pretty solid party games, don't misunderstand me. None of what I've said is an overt criticism of Mario Kart Wii at a base level, because it's when you begin to take the game seriously, beating every cup in 150cc, using item strategy to your advantage, and optimizing your gameplay, that the true beauty of Mario Kart can shine through. And despite everything I've said so far, when you do master Mario Kart Wii's playstyle, avoiding getting bumped out of a wheelie, 
taking corners as tight as possible with inside drifting, memorizing both mushroom and non-mushroom shortcuts, and using this game's items to your advantage, Mario Kart Wii becomes the most competitively enthralling game in the entire series. I don't claim to be a master at this game by any means, as this game involves a lot of tech to play with any sort of finesse, but playing this game at a high level is one of the most exhilarating feelings I've ever experienced in any racing game. It's fast, it's aggressive, it's strategic, and it's highly skill-driven. Luck is a factor when it comes to items, and I dislike pretty much all of the original items that Mario Kart Wii introduced. The Mega Mushroom is basically a worse star, and although it can squish other players, you are still susceptible to lightning stars and bullet bills. The POW block is barely an inconvenience because you can avoid the worst effects of it by performing a wheelie. And the Thundercloud... Okay, on paper this is a pretty cool item. When you obtain it you drive faster and you have to bump into another racer to get rid of it before it shrinks you. Once they have it, they can still give it back to you. It's like hot potato. The added speed can also help you take shortcuts. That said, I hate this thing so much. Great, I love being punished for trying to turn the tables with an item. When I look at the render for this item, I can hear the buzzer sound in my head. I've been able to get rid of it plenty of times, but most players on Mario Kart Wii are good enough to know how to avoid getting bumped into someone that has it. I hate it with a passion, and thankfully it never came back. One positive I will give to Mario Kart Wii's item system is its leniency with the shock. When someone uses it, it cannot be used again for another 30 seconds, allowing you to prepare for when it happens again. This change is significant when it comes to strategy because it guarantees a pattern for the shock that you can use to gain an advantage in a race, so long as you bag and hold onto a star or bullet bill for example. Like I said, luck is still a factor. But I'd argue that Mario Kart Wii's skill-driven nature is way more enjoyable than Mario Kart DS, because it doesn't just amount to knowing how to snake back and forth. It amounts to track knowledge, item strategy, and general driving skills, just as I feel a good Mario Kart game should. Well, as long as you play the meta. If you want to try and win with the Jet Setter against 11 Funky Kongs on Flame Runners, be my guest. In summary, Mario Kart Wii is an amazing Mario Kart game that was birthed by complete accident. It is to kart racing games what Melee is to fighting games, a series of mistakes and oversights that allowed both games to blossom into something far beyond what the developers could have imagined. And to demonstrate this game's beauty, why don't we take a look at what is quite simply my favorite Rainbow Road in the entire series. Every Rainbow Road in the series feels like it was designed with each game's specific mechanics in mind a culmination of everything you've learned as you ascend to that dazzling road in the sky. Super Mario Kart's Rainbow Road was designed as a test of your precise turning. Mario Kart Super Circuit built on Super Mario Kart's Rainbow Road with bouncy edges that let you take massive shortcuts, in addition to that solid focus on cornering. Double Dash asked you to master the game's drifting and admittedly more slippery controls in areas that were built to conflict with that control scheme. Mario Kart DS's Rainbow Road challenges your ability to carefully build up mini-turbos with a lack of guardrails on narrow paths. Mario Kart Wii's Rainbow Road plays into the game's own mechanics for sure, but when you've mastered inside drift, wheelies, shortcuts, and when to perform tricks, it becomes another beast entirely. These curvy roads were practically made for inside drift bikes, and going fast on this track is a sensation that can't be beat. It's not the hardest Rainbow Road in the series, but it is one that feels like it was built for Mario Kart Wii's advanced tech and lopsided balancing curve, where a single type of bike is better than any other vehicle. Because of how good it feels to play this track at a high level, it makes me wonder if the developers felt the same way. As I race above the planet we call home, the same planet that spins in the background as I queue for an online match with quiet anticipation, I am reminded of why Mario Kart exists in the first place. Mario Kart Wii had a large focus on its online component, with tournaments of specific parameters, its robust online multiplayer suite, and the ability to view and download ghosts from the internet and compete against them for a better time. Mario Kart's strongest element was its ability to bring people together, regardless of skill or experience with video games, and its leap to an online infrastructure brought that feeling worldwide, connecting an entire network of players directly through the game. Despite what Mario Kart Wii eventually became, alienating people that just want to play the game casually, I believe the spirit of Mario Kart was maintained in the end 
with people that appreciate what is possible at a high level of play. Though I'm glad Mario Kart Wii's metagame and mechanics did not return in any real capacity, this game has formed its own identity for the incredible feats you can achieve through its core gameplay. And I'm totally fine with that. It still maintains an active player base today because of that core gameplay, a testament to how fun it is. And after mulling things over for a while, I believe I've reached a pretty reasonable conclusion about these games in spite of their lack of balancing. Remember when I said that Mario Kart DS is best experienced with players that are relatively close in skill to you? Well, that definitely rings true for Mario Kart Wii. That rings true for every game in the series, really. What matters most is finding that group of people you're comfortable with and having a great time. You don't have to get good at snaking back and forth or inside drift if you don't want to, you just have to find a group of players just as mediocre as you to enjoy the game with. And that's okay. Find the one you like to play most, and just enjoy yourselves. If you're looking for something more because you feel like you've mastered the game, you can find a group of people at that skill level too. And that's why Mario Kart Wii's online experience was so compelling once you knew what you were doing, in spite of everything I've said. I am conflicted on this series' history, all the while utterly fascinated and appreciative of the things that people have accomplished. I think items contributed a lot to closing that gap in skill, and in most of these games, items simply weren't enough. In the journey to create Mario Kart 7 and eventually 8, I think Nintendo did their homework on creating mechanics and items that made the casual and competitive experiences as similar as possible, allowing anyone to achieve a degree of mastery over the game through raw experience. But first, let's take a quick break. Mario Kart has deviated a bit in its 30-year history. Mario Kart in and of itself is a spin-off of the main Super Mario series, but for some reason, Mario Kart has its own spin-offs, making them spin-offs of a spin-off. Are you still following along? Good, let's check them out. The first of these was Mario Kart Arcade Grand Prix, which was released in 2005 on the Triforce Arcade board, a board built from the GameCube architecture. Because of this, the first two games in the series actually run on the GameCube and Wii, as well as Dolphin. It was named Triforce because of the three developers that handled it, Nintendo, Sega, and Namco. And in particular, Namco developed Arcade Grand Prix themselves. To be honest, the game and its sequel are fun, if simplified from their home console counterparts. Because the control interface is a steering wheel and brake and gas pedals, they decided to do something of their own, though mini turbos can still be built from entering a power slide with the tap of the brake pedal. While I do get a kick out of the core gameplay, the course design is deliberately very straightforward to accommodate for the controls, and the items in these games generally feel pretty haphazard and chaotic, with little strategy to speak of. Currently the most common version of the game in circulation is Grand Prix Deluxe, which in my experience you can find in virtually any arcade or Dave & Buster's under the sun. Personally, I think this is the worst of the three installments I've played. The core gameplay might be the most refined in this one, but the item system is awful. Get this, both the items and cart you use throughout each race are selected via a roulette, so any element of strategy is immediately contingent on dealing with the three items you've been given. No thanks, I'll just play Mario Kart at home. While I was in Japan, I did try to capture footage of Mario Kart Arcade Grand Prix VR, but I unfortunately didn't get a chance to play it. Although this game does seem like a pretty cool ride, it is pretty much only playable in any capacity at Bandai Namco's VR Zone, or if you're lucky enough to be around while it's set up in specific cities. That said, I did get to experience Mario Kart Bowser's Challenge, or Mario Kart Koopa's Challenge if you're in Japan. This is an augmented reality ride at Super Nintendo World, and it was pretty much the reason to visit Super Nintendo World in the first place. I'll just get this out of the way now. The sense of scale at Super Nintendo World is unreal, and to say that it feels like you've stepped into the game world would be a gross oversimplification of what it feels like to stand in this park. The entire park is interactive if you have the app, meaning that you can compete for high scores and look for all the park's secrets, in the same vein as looking for hidden Mickeys in Walt Disney World to those of you that ever actually attempted looking for those things on your own. This element is especially important not just as an adaptation of, you know, an interactive form of media, but it's also important because of the park's currently limited amount of space. Though with the Donkey Kong expansion coming soon, I imagine Super Nintendo World has a lot of life left in it when it comes to realizing the worlds of games 
in a theme park setting. A.G. Aonuma was recently spotted observing construction at the park, and people are beginning to wonder if Zelda is part of the plan for the park simply because he was there. This is all obviously speculation, but if Zelda actually happens, I'm going back. Anyway, the queue for Bowser's challenge is an extension of this sense of immersion, which is important for a theme park ride, as the queue is where you'll likely be spending most of your time. Bowser's castle packs in so many details and easter eggs alone, making the line feel like a genuine part of the experience. The ride itself is akin to Buzz Lightyear's Astro Blasters, in which you are in a slow-moving dark ride and you have to compete for a high score by hitting as many racers as possible. While the augmented reality aspect looked way better in person, I couldn't help but expect a Mario Kart ride to be, you know, fast? I don't really feel like the ride translated the feeling of the games at all. Like, I feel like a coaster of some kind would have been better at the very least. Or some kind of actual kart racing experience with augmented reality, allowing racers to use items while they race. And when hit with an item, maybe the cart would briefly slow down or stall. I don't know how practical that would be, and maybe I'm envisioning something that's impossible with current technology. Maybe something more robust wasn't in the cards for Super Nintendo World's opening. Or perhaps they just had a limited amount of space to work with. But you know what? I did enjoy the ride as a whole. It doesn't give Astro Blasters a run for its money, and I wouldn't visit the park exclusively for this ride, but as a part of your trip? It is absolutely worth experiencing, if only for the immersion provided by the beautifully crafted architecture and design of the park. Just don't go to Universal Studios Japan in the summer like I did. Japanese summers are gorgeous, but they do not mess around when it comes to humidity. Stay hydrated and out of the sun when you can. Alas, we are still not done. Another spin-off, Mario Kart Live Home Circuit, gives you the ability to construct your own, flat Mario Kart courses in your living room, and drive around in them with a remote-controlled car. The game then brings these courses to life through augmented reality on the Nintendo Switch, and it plays like an actual Mario Kart game. Like, it translates surprisingly well. I imagine I would have got a lot of mileage out of this game as a kid. That said, there was only so much we could do with flat course designs, and my ideas for more perilous courses ended with Mario falling onto the floor. Ramps and slopes kind of work, but you have to rely solely on the game's ability to chart the course correctly when you use them, and it can't really do that reliably each time. Other than that, I don't have much else to say about this game. Not really worth the price you pay for it, that's for damn sure, but hilariously enough, it's the best job any of these spin-offs ever did of adapting Mario Kart's core gameplay into a new context. The final spin-off I'll be talking about is Mario Kart Tour. After remaining staunchly against entering the mobile gaming market for many years, Satoru Iwata finally gave the go-ahead in one of his final major movements as president of the company. This was done out of concern for Nintendo's dwindling performance numbers each year as they attempted to support the Wii U, as well as the hit they took when smartphones inevitably took the casual market they once held with the Wii. While the mobile games that came out since have varied in terms of quality, I think Mario Kart Tour is possibly the worst of the ones I've played from them. It might be free to play, but I can think of plenty of other free to play games that are more worth your time than this one. Imagine taking the core elements of the Mario Kart series and stripping them down to their absolute basics, with several control schemes that all suck, and yet in the end, it doesn't matter because the game plays itself. The entire game feels automated if you input the bare minimum requirement for any race and it has the audacity to pretend that you are playing with other people, when it's merely just bots that carry names for other users. There is an actual multiplayer mode, but I never got it to work. It's also a gotcha game, with all of the connotations that that might carry for you. I didn't bother with this game for very long, but seeing as it's free, I don't feel the need to complain much about the game. But I figured Nintendo would at the very least try to bring something unique to the medium of mobile games, with a flagship series like Mario Kart. Instead, it feels more like a money-printing piece of software that just... exists. I guess this kind of puts my critiques of the main series games into perspective. With Tor, I can't even be bothered to give it the time of day. Well, this break took kind of a dour turn at the very end, but... Hey, things are looking up for the main series. Let's take a look at Mario Kart 7. By this entry, I think Nintendo realized that something needed to be done about the massive gaps in playstyles between casual and advanced players, and Mario Kart 7 reeled things in massively. 
Perhaps a little too much, as it doesn't really have much of an identity of its own, but it did at the very least pave the way for Mario Kart 8 in a few ways. While I didn't find the gliding sections to add a whole lot to the core gameplay at all, it did at the very least make certain sections in older levels feel cooler when you'd go off of jumps. The customization unfortunately took away the bikes and instead restricts you to just carts, probably because Nintendo wanted to reevaluate game balance after the whole Funky Kong Flame Runner situation, and it really does feel like you can create a build that suits your playstyle. This mechanic would also be greatly expanded in the sequel, but because of the restrictions placed on both vehicle types and the tech you can learn, Mario Kart 7 is a pretty safe and standard Mario Kart game in my eyes. They also scaled the amount of players back to 8 from 12, which I'm guessing was due to hardware restrictions, but a lot of these changes made me want to go back to Mario Kart Wii, especially at the time. It also scaled back its character roster in comparison to that game, with the only real noteworthy additions other than good old Wiggler and Lakitu being the Honey Queen from Super Mario Galaxy. Gotta say, I didn't see this coming. And yeah, she never came back. That being said, I have to give credit to this game for its strongest asset, the track design. There are a ton of genuinely excellent tracks in Mario Kart 7, with many of them throwing a wrench in your typical racing habits. In terms of theming, DK Jungle is a great way to honor Donkey Kong Country Returns. Music Park's simple design is heightened by its melody-fueled gameplay, and Neo Bowser City's concept is cool enough on its own, but the added threat of rain-reducing traction on these difficult turns make it a highlight as a test of your driving skills. And I adore the two Woohoo Island tracks. Wii Sports Resort's cohesive island connecting each of its sports was a welcome setting, but I was not expecting them to create tracks based around them in a Mario Kart game, and they rock. To my knowledge, this is the first Mario Kart game to introduce tracks with laps being divided into sections, meaning that tracks with this structure can be more diverse and varied around a central theme as you speed through them, and the Woohoo Island tracks use this to great effect. You can also drive underwater in this game, which is used in tracks like Cheap Cheap Lagoon and Wario Shipyard. Some other tracks I love include Rock Rock Mountain, solely for its massive off-road portions that you can speed through if you have the mushrooms and game knowledge to spare as well as Rosalina's Ice World, for being an ice level that isn't overly focused on slippery controls and wide open terrain, instead wanting you to do some tight drifting. Plus, it's a level named after Rosalina, so that automatically makes it good. And to top it all off, Mario Kart 7 has my second favorite Rainbow Road in the entire series, right behind Mario Kart Wii. It takes the single continuous lap concept and runs with it here, implementing so many different fun ideas all themed around an interstellar race above the planets, along the rings of Saturn. It's a beautiful interpretation of Rainbow Road, and one that thrives in spite of Mario Kart 7's simplicity solely through its inspired and creative design. I have to give credit to Mario Kart 7 for recapturing the simplicity of the series, whilst maintaining both its evolution in terms of mechanics and its stellar track design. It may not be known for its wild tech, but that just means more people can pick it up and play and that's always what Mario Kart should have been about. In many ways, Mario Kart 7 got the series back on track, and set up what I believe to be the definitive game in the series. Mario Kart 8. To me, Mario Kart 8, and especially its Switch port Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, give all of the questions I asked at the beginning of this video a satisfying answer, all the while addressing problems with previous Mario Kart games. And one of the best ways the game signifies this is with its main theme, both an introduction to the Jazz Fusion soundtrack of Mario Kart 8, but also a revisitation of Super Mario Kart's main theme. Ever since the original game, Mario Kart has carried a leitmotif, which has been embedded in every single game's main theme. Mario Kart 64 welcomed you in with its main theme, and it chose to draw out Super Mario Kart's lead melody, which would eventually become standard for each game's theme. Double Dash's theme is frantic and unrestrained, but it eventually circles back to that lead melody. Mario Kart DS, Wii, and 7 all carry that melody as well. 
But with Mario Kart 8, they decided to go right back to the way Super Mario Kart delivered that melody as a representation of how Mario Kart 8 returns the series to its roots. Rather than boxing players into specific playstyles if they want to get good at the game, I believe any advanced play in Mario Kart 8 is connected to the core gameplay of drifting, item strategy, and knowing when to take shortcuts and collect coins. It's about creating a build and playstyle that you're happy with and going for gold. Bikes are back, and the game introduces ATVs as well. And with this decision came an actual push from Nintendo to balance the game accordingly. In the Mario Kart 8 Direct from April 2014, there was a segment that deliberately brought up time trials and how much the vehicle you choose matters. They made it a point to demonstrate that between carts and bikes, in Mario Kart 8, it depends primarily on the course. They even outright said that they wanted to avoid a situation where one vehicle was clearly better than any other. Just like Super Mario Kart, it all depends on the course you pick. What matters most in Mario Kart 8 is how fast you can charge mini turbos, and whatever vehicle allows you to do that comfortably is good enough. Inside Drift is no longer a requirement, it is an option with its own benefits depending on how you like to play. Let's talk about Mario Kart 8's central mechanic, anti-gravity, and how it impacts both racing and track design. For one thing, you can now bump into other racers for a quick burst of speed in these sections, as well as these spinning posts, but it also allows tracks to be these mind-bending, physics-defying feats, with the signature track of the game being a straight-up Mobius strip, a track represented beautifully right in the game's logo. Bumping into players and cutting corners in these sections can often be a viable strategy for a comeback, and it introduces plenty of variety into how tracks are designed. Tracks have ripples that you can trick off of, they have anti-gravity sections that impact the physics of your kart, as did the underwater and gliding sections of Mario Kart 7, and they completely reinvent the retro courses, making Mario Kart 8 at times feel like it has 8 original cups, rather than 4 new cups and 4 old ones. Take the Super Circuit levels for example, which were designed essentially from scratch for this game to take advantage of the anti-gravity mechanic. Mario Circuit is transformed because of its giant anti-gravity curve in the center of the track. Toad's Turnpike maintains the traffic of its predecessor, but it now has a section where you can get out of the way and collect coins if you need to increase your speed. That's also another element that restores balance to Mario Kart 8. Coins. Mario Kart 7 was technically the first game to bring these back, so credit to that game once again, but now you can get them in first or second place from item boxes. You need 10 to reach your top speed, but you can no longer go over that cap. In a match where one player is better than another at driving, they will need to take wider and slower lines in order to replenish their coin count, which automatically slows them down while they make that time investment. Some coins are placed along the main path, of course, but racers will often be fighting for them, giving races these intrinsic elements of both strategy and balance, especially when the items begin to fly. And Mario Kart 8 accounts for coins through incredibly layered, strategic, and varied track design. Mario Kart Stadium kicks things off, and immediately it gives players three choices. Take a wide turn to collect coins, use a mushroom to cut through the off-road, or stay down the middle and try to drift as tight as possible. This is how a lap starts and ends, with the middle anti-gravity section having a similar dynamic that you can switch between, depending on the situation, and if you're getting blasted with items. This is the kind of strategy that makes Mario Kart such a compelling game, and this is only the first level. Toad Harbor, for example, has multiple paths to take depending on the level of risk you want to take for a reward, as well as hazards, the multiple path philosophy for Mario Kart Stadium, and shortcuts aplenty. Thwomp Ruins is the same way, as is Twisted Mansion, Water Park, and Sunshine Airport. They are all designed with this split-second decision-making in mind, and Anti-Gravity just opens up Pandora's box to possibilities for brilliant course design. Dolphin Shoals implements underwater and anti-gravity racing, while giving each section of the level identity and utility. Not to mention, the music is amazing. Each section utilizes different instrumentation to reflect your surroundings, and as you emerge from the water, you're treated to an absolutely killer saxophone solo.
Just as an aside, Mario Kart 8 has one of the greatest soundtracks I've ever heard in a video game, to the point where its jazz fusion direction feels like it has defined the series' sound ever since. It was all recorded live, meaning that each race feels larger than life thanks to that big band sound. Mario Kart 64's Rainbow Road has never felt this good to race in, and it might be much shorter than before with not a lot going on, but man does it make me want to cry tears of joy. Mario Kart 8 also has continuous lap courses, though they aren't as common as Mario Kart 7's, sadly. That said, Mount Wario is awesome. You have to race down a snowy mountain with all the things that entails. Icy roads in lap 1 as you're trying to collect coins, a cave with a running waterfall and multiple paths to take, as well as a clear shortcut if you're looking to get through as fast as possible, a forest full of trees that will mess with even the very best of players due to their pattern, and a ski slalom that wants you to drift as tightly as possible to optimize your run through these turns. In time trials, I basically drift in a straight line through this section. Dude, every single track in the Star Cup is perfect. Sunshine Airport kicked things off with its strategy and fun race lines, Dolphin Shoals letting the environment impact how you race, Electrodome for its focus on drifting and bumping into players, and finally Mount Wario as an endurance run to round things out. I think the Star Cup in Mario Kart 8 might be the best run of courses the series has ever had. I mean, Bowser's Castle in the Special Cup is fantastic for its use of the game's central mechanics in a grueling test of skill, and I enjoy the space station concept in Rainbow Road and especially its use of anti-gravity for shortcuts and drifting, but the Star Cup is on another level of pure fun and adrenaline. Rainbow Road was a great way to round out this game's run of original courses, though, and it implements all of Mario Kart 8's signature elements beautifully. But how do vehicle parts factor into this? Is there a clear best option this time? Well, let's take a look. All of my points of discussion are based on what is presumed to be the final balance update for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. The Wii U version has its own metagame that complicates things further, but will keep things simple with the version of the game that most people play. There are four kinds of vehicles in Mario Kart 8. Carts, bikes, sport bikes, and ATVs. Sport bikes are the only vehicles with inside drift, and as I mentioned, they invite their own way to play through sharply cutting corners in your drift. But the learning curve and overall tweaks the developers made to inside drifting don't immediately make it the best option. All other vehicles use outside drift, which wipes away the metagame of Mario Kart Wii that felt so alienating to casual players. Frustratingly, Mario Kart 8 once again opts to hide the Mini Turbo stat, and there are a couple of other hidden stats as well, but the Mini Turbo stat is once again the most important and I wish it wasn't hidden. You can view your build stats in a comprehensive and digestible manner by inputting your parts and character on Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Builder. This time around, Mini Turbo governs how fast your Mini Turbos actually build, and they usually build fastest if you're using the roller wheels, which looks stupid, but add a huge Mini Turbo and Acceleration bonus to any build you use. You can also get a massive boost to your Mini Turbo stat by playing as one of the lighter characters, like the babies. This also massively boosts your acceleration, and as such, the heavier the character, the higher their speed, but the lower their acceleration will be. Currently, the best combo in the game is viewed as Yoshi, Teddy Buggy, Roller, and Paper Glider for its excellent Mini Turbo, Acceleration, and Handling. The Cat Cruiser has the same stats with higher invincibility, but ATVs drift better. It's not the fastest in terms of top speed, but it's decent enough, and it makes up for that in all other regards. I mean, with certain Mini Turbo and Handling oriented builds, you can essentially negate the speed stat from drifting as frequently as possible to build constant Mini Turbos. Kind of like Mario Kart DS if it wasn't as sweaty. Therefore, is joining the Yoshi Hive Mind something you should do because of its ease of use? Well, to be honest, no. It is very good, but as well-rounded as this combo is and despite its usage in high-level play, if you have an alternative build that suits how you like to play, or you just want to look cool, you can always create a build that prioritizes what you like most. My current favorite build, Rosalina, the Duke, Azure Rollers, and the Cloud Glider doesn't sacrifice too much acceleration or mini turbo, and its top speed is a decent chunk faster. Plus, I get to rep my favorite character in the process. I've also used Kamek in the Biddy Buggy because he can not only build mini turbos almost as fast as the babies, but he doesn't sacrifice a whole lot of top speed either, meaning that you can snake back and forth and get a decent boost from the mushrooms. 
Even the basic Mario build isn't that bad. While its mini turbo and acceleration leave a lot to desire, it balances both high top speed and handling, which is rare for speed builds in this game. The point I'm trying to get at here is that all of those advanced playstyles in previous games are now entirely optional if they tickle your fancy, as are seemingly endless combinations that you can specifically tailor to how you like to play. All the while, the game is focused on those core elements of driving well, knowing the tracks, and using items strategically. This is what Mario Kart should have always been about. And I believe Mario Kart 8's focus allows anyone to not only have a great time, but enables them to play the game at a high level if they so desire. The difference between inexperienced and seasoned gameplay simply boils down to those three elements I keep mentioning. Speaking of which, let's talk about items. First of all, the blooper doesn't just ink your screen. It now causes everyone hit by it to lose traction, making turning much more difficult for a short period of time. New to this game, the piranha plant chomps players and coins in its path, giving you a boost every time it chomps. The boomerang flower gives you three chances to hit something in your path, but you have more control over its trajectory than a green shell, and it's much faster. The crazy eight, which adapts a similar item from Mario Kart 7. You have to be lagging behind significantly to obtain this, and I really only ever use the star in case I get hit by a shock and lose everything, but it's nice to have the items on hand. And finally, the most important item of all. Though you could actually escape the Great Equalizer in a few of the games by timing a mushroom boost correctly, or by getting hit by something and taking advantage of the invincibility frames, Mario Kart 8 introduces the ability to easily destroy the blue shell before it hits you with the Super Horn. Finally, you have a way to deal with the Great Equalizer, and though it is hard to obtain in first place, I tend to hang on to it whenever I'm front running and come across it, just in case. You can also use it to deal with any other items and players coming your way, but it's all about strategy, so use it wisely. Something that Mario Kart 7 introduced that is brought to the forefront in 8 is the distance-based item distribution. Depending on how far away the rest of the racers are from first place, more powerful items can appear in higher places. This right here was an essential move in closing the gap in skill. It discourages players from front running for too long, as they need to either hang onto the right items by cycling through them at item boxes, or close the gap between each player. This inherently gives other players a chance to catch up, even if they aren't that good at the game. It restores that original philosophy for Mario Kart that gradually fell by the wayside, all the while not sacrificing the fun of being skilled at the game. Some may disagree with this change, but many of the changes made with this game are a huge reason why I find myself coming back to it more than previous games. It feels like it was truly made for everyone. With all of this in mind, I was ready to consider Mario Kart 8 my favorite game in the series. But the original Wii U version of the game had the stinkiest battle mode in the entire series. What the hell is this? You have a selection of racetracks to play on, and you can only play Balloon Battle. Then you have to drive all around and look for other players to hit. There's a reason the battle arenas of past games were boxed in arenas. Driving a lap around Toad's Turnpike to find people is not fun. Yoshi Valley makes for a surprisingly good battle arena thanks to its multitude of paths, but it doesn't make up for an overall lackluster battle mode offering. This would eventually be rectified in Deluxe, but we'll get to that. Shortly after the game's release, Nintendo released four additional cups as DLC for only $14.99. It came out in two waves, and these tracks brought their own innovations to the game. The first wave surprised everyone by including a track based on The Legend of Zelda, and making Link a playable character. I was flabbergasted when this happened. What is this, Super Smash Kart? It was a common talking point at the time, but really, I was just excited for this level to come out. The level has all sorts of fun easter eggs like the piranha plant being Boko Baba plants, the coins being rupees, and all that good stuff, but really, it was all worth it just to see Link ride a motorcycle. Wave 1 also brought a few original tracks like Excite Bike Arena, which was essentially a dice roll in the same vein as Baby Park, funny considering they added Baby Park to the game in Wave 2, Dragon Driftway, which I absolutely love as a fan of tracks that encourage continuous drifts, Ice Ice Outpost, which I never got the hang of, but once you master it, you have plenty of options for routes, and Mute City. Yeah, instead of making a new F-Zero game, Nintendo would rather honor the series with a track or two in Mario Kart. 
the game that some have cited as the reason F-Zero is dead. And you know what? This track is awesome. It adapts the gameplay of F-Zero into the game surprisingly elegantly, with the energy replenishers now giving you coins, and a consistent sense of speed being the central theme, what with all the boost pads and anti-gravity sections. It emulates the gameplay of F-Zero well, and naturally, the music is kick-ass. It flows like a jazz song thanks to its percussion, it reflects the aggressive driving of F-Zero with its guitar, and the saxophone sits pretty with that guitar, all the while welcoming the melody of Mute City into the Mario Kart universe. When they added Big Blue in Wave 2, I was happy not just because it was a continuous lap track that was incredibly well designed, carrying the hallmarks of Mario Kart 8's level design, but also because the music let the composers have even more fun. You have a splashier bass guitar to drive how groovy this piece is at its core, and the guitars and saxophone dueling constantly. Yeah, I wasn't kidding about Mario Kart 8's soundtrack, man. This is some of the best music I've ever heard in a game. Wave 2 introduced Wild Woods, Super Bell Subway, and a level themed around Animal Crossing, if you can believe it, as well as the Villager and Isabelle as playable characters. We're really stretching the Mario Kart name at this point. A selection of retro courses were also included in the DLC, like SNES Rainbow Road, which I actually prefer to Mario Kart 8's original Rainbow Road level, thanks to how the ripples and jumps transform the way you drive around this level, all the while the core gameplay that made it so cool in Super Mario Kart has been preserved. In 2017, Nintendo released Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which contained all of the content from the Wii U version, new characters and vehicles, and a revamped battle mode. It also gave the item systems even more depth by bringing back two item slots, though their functionality has been altered to make the game less chaotic than Double Dash. You cannot switch between them anymore, meaning that you have to choose whether or not to use your main item sooner rather than later. Also, a boo cannot steal from your secondary item slot, which gives you insurance. As for the battle mode, it is the best in the series. Every single battle mode returns, there are plenty of stages to choose from, and you have a new mode that is essentially cops and robbers. With randoms, this mode is heavily unbalanced, but with a coordinated group of friends over voice chat, this mode can be an absolute blast. All of these things finally pushed me over the edge and made me consider Mario Kart 8 Deluxe my favorite, and one of the greatest racing games of all time. It felt like they could never top this game. And I think they realized that. Mario Kart 8 reminded me why I fell in love with the series to begin with, and it bridges the gap in skill seamlessly as you journey to the higher ranks. It has everything the series was built on, and it's fun to play no matter your skill level. It is the definitive Mario Kart game to me. But really, that means something different to everyone. One of the brilliant things about this series is that each entry is distinct for its own reasons. I once thought that each subsequent Mario Kart game rendered the previous one obsolete, but after going through each game once again, that is far from the case. Each game has its own merits, its own identity, through its mechanics and design, and they are all going to appeal to different people. Like I said at the end of the Mario Kart Wii discussion, I do believe in creating something that everyone can enjoy, but I also feel like there is merit in designing a game for a specific crowd. Think about when Mario Kart and F-Zero coexisted, for example. They offered two completely different experiences for different kinds of players, and while Mario Kart Wii's imbalance may have impacted it at the time, its current player base has adapted to what this specific style of play has to offer. The same goes for Double Dash and Super Mario Kart and every entry in the series. As each of these games stand today, they are wildly different from one another, and that is beautiful. Whenever Mario Kart 9 comes out, I can only hope that it strives to be different and wonderful in its own weird way. In examining this series, I've learned a lot about Mario Kart, more than I ever thought I could learn about Mario Kart. But it was also some of the most fun I've ever had making a video for this channel. 
It ignited some friendly competitions, like a time trial challenge on Mount Wario, a tournament for fans of the channel, several get-togethers with my friends, and heated discussion over the benefits of each game's mechanics. These games brought people together from all walks of life, and all levels of skill. That, to me, is the true power of Mario Kart. Its ability to bridge that gap in skill, coupled with each game's appeal to different wants and needs, make it one of the most important video game series of all time. So, to briefly answer my questions, that is why Mario Kart has endured for so long. It is simply one of the finest and most creative racing games you will ever play. And it's a default for so many people because of its simplicity, its hidden depth, and its ability to allow everyone to have a good time. This is why I so desperately wanted that sense of balance that Mario Kart 8 eventually found. But this is also how I came to acknowledge the uniqueness of each entry. Long story short, no, Mario Kart is not a dice roll. It's a damn good game, and I'm glad I grew up playing it.